So as you know, or if you were here last week, I made an announcement that I'm teaching a class called homiletics, which uh, coming up, and you're going to be in that, yes, uh, and s yes, and it's, homiletics is about s giving sermons. So I read a lot about giving good sermons, and I read once some wisdom about how a good sermon is very much like a really good sandwich. It's similar to a really good sandwich in that it's got two really important ends, and in the sandwich case, it's, you know, the beautiful, yummy artesian bread, and in the sermon, it's the beginning and the ending, it's the intro and the, and the conclusion, and in between, there's rich, succulent, juicy meat, or if you're a vegetarian, it's lively, beautiful vegetables. However, unlike a good sandwich, a really good sermon has those two ends really close. Thank you, thank you, thank you, all right. Well, it's your lucky day, because I'm going to follow the sermon sandwich rule this morning and put the ends close, <laughs> because we have something very special to do this morning. It's Palm Sunday, and that's why we have these beautiful roses up here. We have a tradition here. It's a Palm Sunday rose blessing. So the talk is going to be shorter than normal so that we have time to have this beautiful experience in our rose blessing. But I do have to give you a little Palm Sunday, uh, a little Palm Sunday story. So it's a story of the family woke up on, on Palm Sunday morning. They're all getting ready to go to church, and little Johnny has got a sore throat, and so he decides, they decide he better not come to church, so they kept him at home. When the family got home, they were all carrying palm fronds with them. And Johnny said, why do you guys have palm fronds? I don't understand. What, what, what is this? And the, and the mom said, well, it was Palm Sunday. And so people held palm fronds over Jesus' head as he walked by. And little boy says, just my luck. The one Sunday, Jesus comes to church and I'm not there. <laughs> okay, that's it for bad jokes. No more. No more, but you are lucky that you are here today, and so now I've used the word lucky two times because we're going to bring our theme of lucky, being a lucky person to a close. This month, we have explored and married science and spirituality by looking at an, a 10-year experiment that was done in England back in the 90s on luck. What makes someone lucky or unlucky? And of course, you know, I'm putting that in quotes because we do not believe in luck. But the um, creator of this 10-year scientific, social scientific experiment, his name is Dr. Richard Weissman, he then put his results in this book called The Luck Factor. And I love the subtitle of it because it's four simple principles that will change your luck and your life. Change your luck and your life. So what we know, I've said it every Sunday, I'll say it one more time, that in answer to our question, which is the theme of the month, what's luck got to do with it, the answer is what? Nothing. nothing. Luck has nothing to do with it. What has everything to do with it is how we consciously align with the source of all good how we consciously unite with that presence and power of love and light and harmony and truth and peace and plenty. That's what changes our luck. That's when we have a shift. That's when we have a shift inside and that's when we have a shift outside. But this study is so amazing because the study revealed everything that we teach here all the time and it was just put in terms of luck lucky people and unlucky people. So remember, when I say luck, I don't really believe, we don't believe in luck. We believe that it is an alignment with natural good, alignment with the God that we are, and then it is the positive, if you will, use of the neutral law, the law which simply says yes to whatever we plant in it. And there is an invisible law that is saying yes to everything you plant in it. So when we plant in that law, alignment with source, goodness, peace, harmony, seeing the good. When we plant those things in the law, the law gives us that back. It says yes. So that's what we believe spiritually is going on for people who have, and I quote one more time, good luck. So the research revealed four behaviors, if you will, that lucky people engaged in. And each week we've taken one. Today we take the fourth one. And it is lucky people listen to their hunches. 
Lucky people listen to their hunches. How would we say that here? Lucky people what? Listen to their intuition. Listen to their intuition. Absolutely, intuition. I love uh, Reverend Sandy Daly, one of our beautiful members here, calls our intuition the voice that loves me. Isn't that beautiful? I love that. The voice that loves me is our intuition. And that voice, if you don't hear anything at all from me today, if you forget those great jokes that I told you earlier, <laughs> that's okay. But I want you to remember this. That voice that loves you will never steer you wrong. Never. Even if in a moment it looks like it, it, is, it will never steer you wrong because it, it is the voice of the divine in you guiding and directing you. So keep that in mind. It will never steer you wrong. I love this quote from Ernest Holmes in the textbook, Science of Mind textbook. It is on page 342. And Ernest wrote, Intuition is God in us, revealing to us the realities of being, and just as instinct guides the animals, so would intuition guide us if we would but allow it to do so. There it is, right there. And I love, I want to read for you um, what R Dr. Weissman had to say about his des desire to go into this topic of intuition. He said, when I, as comes from this book on page 71 of Lucky Luck Factor, when I asked lucky people and unlucky people what was behind their successful and unsuccessful decisions, they had very little idea how to explain their consistent good luck or bad luck. Lucky people said that they simply knew when a decision was right. In contrast, unlucky people viewed many of their poor choices as yet more evidence of how they were always destined to fail. That's called using the law not for your highest good <laughs> right there. I undertook research to discover why lucky people's decisions led to so much more success and happiness than those of unlucky people. The results were to show the remarkable ability of our minds. Science of mind right there. The remarkable ability of our minds. So according to the research that Weissman did, there are two factors that come into play under the topic of lucky people follow their hunches. The first one will maybe seem like a duh, of course, sort of a Homer Simpson, duh, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> but it's worth talking about for just a brief moment. And that is lucky people listen to and follow their lucky hunches. Listen to and follow. It doesn't do any good to hear them if we don't follow them. Let me say that again. <laughs> it doesn't do any good to hear them <laughs> if we don't follow them. I love this statement on intuition from someone who changed the world, who changed the medical world. This is from a medical doctor. I'll tell you who it is after I share the quote. I love this. It is always with excitement that I wake up in the morning wondering what my intuition will toss up to me today, like gifts from the sea. Huh, going along with your beautiful opening prayer. Like gifts from the sea. I work with it and rely on it. It's my partner. This is from a scientific doctor who was one of the first to discover and develop the vaccine for polio. Jonas Salk said that. Isn't that cool? A medical doctor said that. And look at the change that he made, the life-saving vac vaccination that he developed. He listened to his intuition, and I know it had a hand in guiding him to create that vaccine. <clears throat> So the first idea about lucky people follow their hunches is that they, I mean, that they listen to them and that's the key, they follow them. So I'm going to give you a quick story right now and this is a do as I say, not as I do. Yeah, that's the kind of story. Parents, you do that all the time, right? Kids, do as I say, not as I do. This is a do as I say, not as I, not as I did. <clears throat> so I went to Prescott um, uh, last year, at the end of last year, to do a workshop, a women's workshop up at the Prescott Center for Spiritual Living. And I have been to that center. I, I, I've been there. I don't know how to get there, but I've been there. 
and that's part of the story is I don't know how to get there. And I've also been to Reverend Kathleen, the minister there. I've been to her home. I've been to both places. I have in my phone, under her, in my address book, directions to the church, it says. It's, it, it's written right there. Directions to the church. And I have, you know, take this exit off 17, go here, turn here, turn right, turn left. Blah, blah. I have directions to the church. I underscore that. Pay attention. It said. To the where? Church. Thank you. All right. So <clears throat> I'm... I'm now off the 17, I'm into Prescott, I'm driving, and I, and, I, and I get this voice, loud as day, clear as a bell, that says, hmm, I don't think those are the directions to the church, I think those are the directions to her house. How many of you, just, just you don't have to say, but um, just think, you hear the voice and then you argue with it. <laughs> so my mind went, what do, you, what do you mean directions to her house? I have written down the directions to the church, and it, uh, that's stupid. Of course it's not her house. It's the church. So I follow those. I even put my GPS on my phone, and it gave me different directions than what I had written, but I re had written it there. So the GPS clearly doesn't know either. <laughs> my internal voice doesn't know. The GPS doesn't know. My notes and my phone, which I did in my own intelligence. So I'm driving, and now I, I did, it's a little farther than I thought, and I didn't give myself as much time as, so it, I'm now starting to bump up against some time issue and getting a little bit, oh, okay, you know, you don't really want to be late to a workshop you're offering and you're new, so I already told Pam, don't be late, but you know how to get here, so you won't be late. So I'm starting to get a little bit nervous. I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm almost there. I'm almost there. I make the last turn, and I said to myself, oh, I won't say it here, but I said something to myself like, holy, mm-hmm. <laughs> I am going to Reverend Kathleen's house because I had been there before. I knew once I got on her street <laughs> that I was on her street, not the church. Somehow I had written directions to church incorrectly. So to finish this story, my, my point is, I didn't listen. <laughs> and the voice that loves me, my intuition, will never steer me wrong despite directions I have written down. It, but I didn't listen to it. Uh, I called Kathleen and said, okay, I'm at your house. Oops, bad me. Uh, you're bad on me. How do I get to the church? She walked me through it. 20 minutes away, the church is. So I was a good 15, 20 minutes late to the workshop. Thank goodness they were forgiving and kind and loving. And we went on and, and did what we needed to do. But this is a do as I say, not as I do. The thing, the thing about that is I have developed my intuition. And the next point is lucky people hone their intuition. I have honed mine. And it was so loud. It, it, it was like, this is to our house. But I was ignoring it. I'm going to come back to that in a second. But I want to speak a little bit more to the second point that lucky people do something to, con to consciously and deliberately hone their intuition. So Weissman, as part of this survey and this research that he did, he, he, he like read, what, you know, what are things that, that hone intuition? And he took different research projects and things that have been done and came up with four things, all of which statistically measured to help and hone intuition. And then he ran... Th these four things passed his study group and statistically, again, showed that they absolutely hone intuition, one of which completely blew the chart off of all the other three. So here they are, the three things, or I'm going to give you the three and then I'll give you the fourth one that blew the chart off, um, it, it, what people can do to boost or hone their intuition. So the first one is simply finding a quiet place to think and be with. This is, in, you know, in relation to, like, making a decision. What's the right decision? Just have a quiet place. Go to your quiet place, wherever that is. So that's number one. That helps. Number two that helps is to use a technique to clear your mind and get all the chatter and the, I could have cleared my mind about, no, this is not the direction <laughs> to, to the church or that, you know, my inner voice was telling me. Clear your mind. The third one I really love, and because it, it gives some credence to a statement that I adore from one of my favorite characters, just because she's so amazingly gorgeous. Um, it's return to the problem later. Return to the problem later. And so I think of Scarlett O'Hara saying, fiddle dee dee, I'll think about that tomorrow, right? Right? Most gorgeous woman in the history of the universe in my mind and the clothes, but that's a whole nother story. Right? So those are three things that can, you can do to hone your intuition. Find a quiet place, 
techniques to clear your mind and let, let it go, relax and surrender, let it go for a time before you come back to it. But the number one, the biggest way, the most statistically verifiable way that people hone their intuition is to do a spiritual practice we teach here all the time. What do you suppose it is? Meditation. Not necessarily meditation on your problem or your issue or whatever, just have a meditation practice. As we have a meditation practice, we hone and boost our intuition. My unscientific research that I have done for 21 years as a spiritual leader about how to hone our intuition goes absolutely back to the first one, which is follow. When you listen to and follow your intuition, it gets louder and clearer and more certain that it is in fact your intuition. When you listen and don't follow, listen and don't follow, listen and don't follow, how many of it? Listen and don't follow, all of a sudden that voice starts to get softer. Because why should it talk to you if you're not going to listen to it? Did you hear that? <laughs> Why should it speak to you if you're not going to listen to it? So it goes into silence, goes into silence mode. But if you listen to it and follow, and listen to it and follow, and listen to it and follow, which I've done for years, I teach listening to intuition. I do listen to it most of the time. It was so loud in my head, and as I look back on it, I'm like, oh my gosh, how could I have not followed that? Wow, that was a strong ego <laughs> in operation there. But what it did for me, the blessing of that was it made me realize, again, at an even deeper level, my intuition will never steer me wrong. Never. So, lucky people hone their intuition, they listen to it, and they follow. And when we do that, we have this key so that we don't have to push our luck, but instead we pull our good to us. We align with source. We, we bring to us that which uplifts and empowers us. We bring to us that which is for our highest good. When Weissman decided to end his research, 10 years of research, he decided to end it by opening up what he called a lucky school. And he invited all of his people that were in his research study who considered themselves unlucky to come to his research school. And in it, he taught them tools, techniques, practices to help them expect the good. That's lucky factor number one. Expect your good to come to you. And we added, become a living embodiment of that expectation. But he taught them how to do that. He taught them how to maximize what they already have and take advantage of the infinite unlimited possibilities that are presented in front of us all the time. That's number two. He taught them how to do that. He taught them how to turn their bad luck into good by looking at the blessing or the positive in whatever might happen. And we turned that a bit to say we look for the God in everything. And he taught them how to develop and hone their intuition. Now, this wasn't a four-year school. It wasn't a one-year school. It wasn't a six-month school. It was one month. One month, he had them in intense work on those four factors. And in that one month, 80% of his unlucky people said their luck had changed. And they were happier. So my invitation to you is that you take the month of April and enroll in your own luck school. Put those four ideas in places where you can see them around your house. Live into those four principles this month coming up. And I bet, because <laughs> I'm lucky, right? I, I have, I have, it's, a good, it's a good bet that you would be part of that 80% where your luck doesn't change, but your life. Let's anchor that in prayer. So we turn within. We breathe deeply. Down into our solar plexus we breathe. Into that lucky charm that we experienced and, and, and explored last week. Dantian. We align 
those three centers like we did last week. If you don't know what I'm talking about, get the CD. Listen to the podcast. And as we center ourselves and align ourselves, we open our minds and our hearts and the very being of who we are to that good, that great, that glorious presence of divine energy, of divine life, of spirit. Recognizing that it flows in us and as us and through us. It is who and what we are. And we are who and what of it. Of that ocean, as Tara so beautifully said, that is who we are, but bigger than we are. And I love the Rumi quote it, that we are the entire ocean in a drop of water. I am. And just say to yourself, I am the entire ocean in a drop of water. I am God in form. I am life being expressed uniquely and perfectly as me. This is the truth. And so as I know that for myself, I know it for each and every one of us, and I call forth as I speak my word, the divine law to say yes, which it just already is saying yes, to our highest good. And for the discipline and the, and the focus to make these factors a part of our lives, to bring them into our experience, to expect the good, to see the best, to take advantage of what we have and the opportunities in front of us and to develop and listen to that intuition. I know that that which we need, want, and desire to have, what it takes to bring those disciplines into our life, we have. And in that, there is a shift, there is a transformation in us which shifts and transforms our lives for the good and the lives of those around us and it just moves out into the, year, into the world. Well, how great, how glorious, how good this is. And I know that it is so, so with gratitude, I accept it. With gratitude, I believe it. With gratitude, it is done. And so I release now and let go. Let this word go into the perfect law and call it good. And in faith, in trust, and truth, we say together, and so it is. Amen.